Movement since 1980, and was a young student with uh, Governor Ronald Reagan and the introduction of, of SDI going way back then. Um, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we don't push for any specific system. We are about uh, making our world safer through the deployment of missile defenses around the world. I have uh, just come back from a 12-day missile defense tour in Korea, in Japan, in Guam, and flew in from Hawaii last night. Uh, we were there to recognize over 80 missile defense soldiers, airmen, uh, that are in place today in those very regions in defending against the North Korean threat. This is something that we've done uh, over the years in bringing forth recognition of excellence and leadership to them. We uh, started in, uh, in Yongsong Army Garrison on, in Seoul on the day of the HS-15 launch. We were in Korea on that day, and our, our recognition event was during uh, that day later on. Um, we had the opportunity to bring forward representatives of, of the Patriot crews of South Korea, their second brigade and their third brigade, as well as their brigade commander. Uh, we had, for the first time in the United States, our most uh, uh, integrated missile defense land-based uh, crews that we've ever done before. So we had the THAAD crew that was deployed, that is deployed today, and members of them. We had the Avenger, the, the, the Avengers that are, and the seven radars that are protecting the THAAD in, in, in South Korea. And we had our Patriot uh, uh, soldiers there as well. Um, we then went to Japan and Okinawa and did the 1-1. One -one. Um, which is our Patriot Battalion that is there protecting that island and, and recognize them along with the Japanese. Uh, they have their, both their Air Forces and their Patriot uh, units in Okinawa and also their Army with short range missile defense capabilities, which are the Tan Sun, I think it's the Tan, is it the Tan? I think it's Tan and uh, Sun. A version of, of the probably a little bit more greater range than the adventures that we have. Um, we went to Tokyo. We had an opportunity to meet with the, uh, the general of the Air Force for Tokyo, General Sugiyama. Um, and then we went over to Guam, uh, where we were there uh, when the B1s left to do the exercise last week, um, and was there with our FAD unit and uh, recognized our FAD unit. Uh, that, that's a deployment there. And then we finished off in Hawaii uh, on December 7th. Uh, we have our 94th WABC command, which, which oversees all our missile defense systems in the Pacific. And we, they brought in their team uh, and, and recognized some of their excellence that was there. So I wanted just to, so a couple, couple of quick viewpoints on, on what we've seen, um, and starting with, from, from my perspective, my layman's perspective on the outside of it, but, but we know that the Korean Peninsula is where the cutting edge of integrated air missile defense is for the world. It is the first place, the first time that we've had the THAAD battery having to operate with the Patriot units. The THAAD radar has far better discrimination capabilities and, and targeting than the Patriot radars. This is the only brigade in the world that has the most, uh, PDB-8, most modernized brigade, with the MSC missiles. So the MSC missiles, which have a greater range than the Patriot 3s, are all in place in, in Korea. So that integration is absolutely critical. That's the layered piece that, that Clem will, will talk to you about on it. Um, at, you know, at the, tep, the, the North Korean test, there isn't a a shock, there isn't a change, that, that economy, that city is thriving, so they are not, uh, not affecting the economy or the life of the, of the South Koreans in what's going on with the North Korean leader and those testing aspects of it. You should know that, that South Korea has 11 divisions on the DMZ, very, conf very, very confident, morale super high, 
and you know the, that their ability to defend and there's not a there's not a legitimate threat by the North Koreans to, to beat that force that is out there that are not going to invade the South in the South Korea aspect of it. Um, in Japan, the one one Patriot uh, Battalion there supported the modernization in Korea. So they sent their battalions, they sent their Patriots over there to help while they modernized uh, the Patriots in, in Korea. They um, <clears throat> are the next ones getting the MSC missiles and getting the PDB-8s. And obviously the, the weather there is very difficult for our, our maintenance and so forth because of the tropical uh, situations that are there. The layered aspect for Japan and for the Japanese, it's really based on their Aegis, their Aegis uh, convoy <laughs> ships, which have a, a very, uh, the fundamental first generation or SM3 block 1A missiles on it for their first shot. And their Patriot, they have six uh, or seven Patriot battalions. That is their layer of defense that they rely on. They are obviously very concerned with the HS-15, with the ICBM speeds that it showed and creating a, a, a layer of defense they are really looking into the Aegis Ashore based in Japan and create uh, an IMD as well as a BMD capability on that. They are looking at Korea and the FAD because the Olympics are going to be in Korea this, this next year and watching how that's going to work when they look at hosting the Olympics in, in 2020 uh, on that aspect of it. Um, Moving back to Guam, <laughs> we, we know that uh, really for the first time, our Navy is with their baseline nine ships and their ships are out front having to defend a territory for the first time. The, the, the Navy's ships have been part of our BMD architecture for the U.S. homeland in helping with the center part of it, but now for the first time they've had to be out front. It's our first shot opportunity against North Korea on the island of Guam. So they are working that process through, and behind that obviously is our THAAD system that is in place today uh, defending uh, Guam and certainly defending our ability to, to push up offense out there as you saw with, with the B1s and the B-52s that come, come back and forth. Um, with Guam, uh, we've noticed, and I spent some time with Lieutenant Governor, that there has been a, a dramatic economic effect on the threat that was was stated by the North Korean leader on Guam. They've had a 40% decrease in tourism, mostly Japanese this last month. So they, they are very concerned about uh, that part of it. Um, moving to Hawaii, uh, Hawaii I think and the Pacific are, are watching how the Navy is able to defend an island from, from their from their ship platform on it. We know we've got 44 GBIs, limited number. We're, we're gonna have to wait a couple of years before the next RKB comes in. So there there is a, a vulnerability there or a gap, perceived gap if the North Koreans continue to produce the certainly the HS15 and others, but that's where you, there is room for to look at an underlayer of defense, which is the SM3 block 2A which they're looking at possibly testing that against that scene, you know, speeds on that. So that's sort of just a, a broad perspective from my, my perspective. Um, I want to now introduce our, our key, keynote speaker. Oh, I apologize for grabbing John Hill. John Hill, he had other obligations today. He let me know on Friday, so we, we, we apologize for that. But Clem is, is the number one guy. He is the number one flag officer in the Pentagon on IMD and missile defense. He is the guy, there's nobody higher ranking than him on that. Clem, uh, I've got to know Clem way back at Fort College in Carlisle uh, on that, and he got the opportunity to command the world's biggest air defense brigade, the 11th Imperial Brigade, uh, before he got this position that he's in today. He's an up and comer, uh, and I'm gonna pass you over to him, but I'd say Clem, Besides there in some of the U.S., you might want to work on the Redskins on this past yesterday on that score. Sassy uh, Red got a victory yesterday, so it was pretty good. So thanks for being here. Appreciate the, the you guys taking time out of your Monday morning to come here. I know it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, 
Um, yeah, Admiral Drew Admiral John Hill, my, my partner in the Missile Defense Agency, really, really great teammate. And <coughs> he couldn't be here, but I think he could be here because the loss they took this weekend. And uh, <laughs> so it was, uh, you might go off on the uh, Army had a great weekend and maybe did not. But uh, he, he really, really extends his, uh, his, his regards um, as he uh, kind of pushes through some, some other issues. And as I really stated, I, yeah, I've kind of grown up doing this in, in the field. I got a former soldier teammate of mine in the back right there. Uh, was special Smithson, you know, years ago when I was a battalion commander, and now Miss Smithson as she kind of moves through into the, her new transition life here. But you know, I, I do. I really love serving with troops. I love serving in the field. Uh, I've had the opportunity to serve from the platoon leader level, from Desert Storm, where 42 Scuds came into to Israel, to setting conditions in Israel as a battalion or as a battalion executive officer and operations officer to uh, commanding forces in the CENTCOM area of operations overseas as we set the uh, set the globe over there. Um, so, I, so I have done a little bit of this stuff at the tactical level. The hard part is what I'm doing right now. And that's when you're working the requirements and the programming and the resource business because there's just too many levers out there to pull on it. You think, okay, we have a need out there, we have a requirement here, and then we feel capability and we should be good to go. Um, at the end of the day, there's, there's, there's always competing demands of, of policy. There's never enough. There, there's different spikes in the globe that certainly require air defense capacity on a, on a really on a month-to-month -month basis. It could change. You know, when I came into Brigade Command in 2012, it was all things with the Iranian threat. And for obvious reasons, it's all things about U.S. forces Korea right now. And that's what my team is kind of represented back here with Mike Solis and Ron Crowther uh, help me do on a daily basis. I wear three hats and what I do at the Pentagon as part of the, the, the J-8, uh, kind of the resource and requirements business. Um, I do have the integrated missile defense hat and that's what I'm here today for. Uh, but I also have what's called a protection hat, which these days deals with counter unmanned aerial systems, which is uh, something that's, that's near and dear to our hearts as we look at the air domain. And the other piece is the Joint Requirements Office, which deals with chemical and biological defense. And I say those three things because they kind of vex on each other when you look at the fact that if you did a Venn diagram, uh, ballistic, ballistic missiles can deliver uh, weapons of mass destruction. Counter UAS is still an air threat and, a, and an air challenge in the air domain that we deal with. And certainly integrating that as the integrated air missile defense hat that I wear here has to bring all of that together. So it's kind of good having that, that whole portfolio because they kind of look over the fence and they see each other uh, really on a daily basis. Um, in the, in the warfighter requirement, we look at this in, in warfighter requirements from urgent and emerging needs. Uh, as Ricky stated, you know, we have two major air defense, Army air defense platforms over on the peninsula right now, and that's Patriot and Thad Weapon System. So one of our, our, our challenges right now, and one of our urges, our urges right now is to make sure that those two systems can, can really work seamlessly with each other. And, and the U.S. Forces Com uh, Commander uh, General Vince Brooks and Admiral Harris over there has kind of stated that as one of their, their high priorities. So that's important that we look at in the building and make sure that the funding's there and the, the research and development is there and, and the modernization is heading in that direction. And then the other piece we look at is, is the studies and analysis. You have to understand that you can't just look at the threat as of yesterday or, or in the next 48, 72 hours. You gotta look and see where this thing is gonna be in the next five to seven years. And you gotta look hard at yourself. You have to look at you know what are the peer competitors out there that that we are, we are faced with, whether, whether it's China, whether it's Russia, whether it's Iran, whether it's North Korea, and then violent extremists at the same time. So you have to, you have to keep pace of not only, you know, the, the we fight tonight uh, mentality out there, but it's how do you start looking at um, what are we gonna need for the future as we kind of start determining what those requirements are, because a lot of them have long lead times. These things don't develop overnight. It's amazing what our men and women do in the labs and the scientists do to, to really keep pace with what is going on out there. I've had, I've had to take a crash course over the last six months on space. Okay, I just kind of figured, okay, well, I'm going to get a sensor from into some of the capability that I need for my Patriot and my Thad systems is going to come from certain satellite feeds. Uh, but I've had to really kind of peel the onion on that that uh, area that I'm really not familiar with and I'm still kind of learning in progress. And so you, you kind of go to where your weaknesses are and, and 
and build up your strength in areas that uh, you have to understand is just as important. Um, because it really is the next frontier. I mean, it, it, is a, it is a fight up there, just as it is a fight on the ground out there as, as our instrument and our combat instrument is dealing with on a daily basis. And so, um, so keep a pace for that threat is important. You always have competing demands of modernization versus readiness. You know, you hear our chief of staff in the Army and the chief of staff in the Air Force, and really all the service chiefs and commandants talk about that is really their number one priority. How do you fight tonight? How do we increase and build a readiness that may have taken a hit over the last several years because of the, the, the constant grind of the, the rotations into the campaigns that we've been dealing with? Once again, that's juxtaposed to the, how do we balance that with modernization? And that's a really, that's a, that's a tough fight. Now I can speak from, from the Army's buy. So the Army budget is 50 plus percent for personnel. Okay, we're not a platform centric service. All right, so we, we pay our soldiers, entitlements, you name it what it is first. Okay, and that's 50 to 52 percent, whatever the, the time is. And then you're going to put about 30 or so percent in readiness, and that's our constant operational maintenance grind of, uh, of, of, of fueling and ensuring that we're, 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 we're maintaining uh, our, our troops out there, et cetera. And then, and then the last one, really the last sliver of the pie, which isn't all of it, probably less than 20% is modernization. So you can kind of see where that can get out of balance. Um, but that's a challenge. I mean, every service chief has to look at that and say, okay, do I, where do I mortgage today's uh, capability against what we need for in the future? And so we look at that as well in, in the hats that we wear in the building as you look out into the avenues. Because um, we want to focus on capacity. I mean, you can read in the open source press that you know, this administration, the, the president, uh, we have strong concurrence to increase our, our, our funding for, for missile defense. Um, so what does that really mean? I mean, it's, it's, do, you, do you put that into all in R&D or do you put that into capacity? Do you buy more missiles? Do you buy more sensors? Do you buy um, things that might improve today's fight over the next couple of years? Or do you look, once again, about five to ten years? Uh, and, and, and we go back and forth, you know, depending on, on on, on who's arguing this or making a, a statement on, on either side, uh, that can be challenging. Policy's gonna look at it maybe a little different than scientists and technologists. Military's gonna look at it maybe different than, than a think tank out there. But we wanna bring all of these different competing thoughts together. And it's important to have that professional friction out there understanding these challenges. Um, the last thing I'll say before we take any, any questions, because I think that's the most important part, is is uh, working, as, as Ricky said, on, on host nation integration, host nation partnership. What does that really mean? And it's not a one size shoe fits all uh, uh, for, for any country out there. The things that we do with, with our partners in, in the Middle East may be different what we're doing in the Asia Pacific, may be different what we're doing in Europe. Um, depending on the relationship, depending on the current policy with that country, depending on what they have purchased. Uh, you know, we are learning a lot, frankly speaking, the U.S. is from the Emiratis and the Saudi Arabians as they prosecute a campaign against the Houthis in Yemen. And so I, I say that because at the same time you ask yourself, all right, well, they're shooting very expensive missiles at a very cheap uh, adversary or threat out there. But it goes back to, you know, when we engage a nickel, you know, with $1,000 just to save a life, absolutely. All right, and you know, you'll do the forensics and you'll, you'll, you'll play Monday morning quarterback afterwards and say, okay, well, we're, we're shooting at these very cheap quadcopters or whatever it is, or inexpensive uh, threat uh, capabilities that, that our adversaries are using, but we're using million dollar missiles, or I'm just kind of using that, you know, hypothetically, because I think we know they're a lot more expensive than that um, in order to counter that. So once again, we have to get back to the building and look at that problem. You know, once again, what, what can we do maybe to thwart or mitigate that threat out there prior to it, us having to actually deal with it in a kinetic fashion. So those are the kind of the, you know, that's my inbox if I, if I can kind of share that with you on a daily basis, a little bit of my background. And, and certainly, Ricky, thanks for, for doing this and giving us an opportunity to, to, to speak. And I, I always learn something sometimes more than like I came with the knowledge, so I appreciate this. Thanks. Thank you. Um, this is a very open forum where we, uh, we want to express uh, your opinions and your thoughts and being able to, to take advantage of, of Clem here and being able to understand the 
picture in Korea and the, the layer of defenses that our country has and where we're going. So I'd like to open up to you to, to ask any question you would like. Um, in the recent budget um, supplemental of $4 billion that had a lot to do with missile defense, there was a bunch having to do with left of launch capability, cyber capability. Can you discuss a little bit, as much as you can in a form like this, about what that looks like? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's a little bit how you define sure. left of launch, because it, it can get, it's a complex statement. I think we're kind of used to saying left of launch, but if you have somebody in, in, in policy, or you may ask an ambassador out there, he, he or she may say, be careful, because does, does that come across as, as preemptive? Okay, so you got to kind of put yourself in the box of what do we mean by left of launch? We're talking about pre-launch, um, etc. So it, it can be, you know, the as I, what I call it, you know, the, the grunt on the ground that can get to a a tell or or a strike package that can that can affect that capability before it can launch. Two certainly, as you said, and I can probably leave at this, you know, whether it be a cyber beam or certainly electronic uh, capability that can. Because the same can be done to us. I mean, that's certainly, we got to look at the, the coin from, from both ends here. But um, it goes back to my, my previous statement of do, do we sit back with the catcher Smith and continue just to wait for the, the wave after wave of, of, uh, of a potential threat to come to US protected assets? Or can we potentially look at putting some research and development? and capability uh, ahead of that launch. And that's, you know, it sounds kind of just very basic and primitive, and, but that's sort of the, the overarching concept. Can I follow up on that with uh, something that you said reminded me that there's been a lot in the news recently about uh, micro, uh, microwave emitting uh, missiles and a capability that was developed by Boeing years and years ago to disrupt uh, circuits and you sort of fly something over a, there and it can sort of microwave out fully electronics. A couple of news agencies have put out stories saying that this is something that's actively being looked at. Um, I don't know if you can comment on that, but maybe you can. I, I can't, but that's the first time I saw it. I, saw, I think I saw it on CBS News or something like that about a week ago, you know? So, uh, yeah, there, there are things behind the curtain, but I will tell you that's the first open source uh, type of capability. And, and I, you know, my, my hunch is these things are, are, are being presented in that fashion, frankly speaking, I think to galvanize some of the expertise that we have out in America that may not understand this technology that invites them into the labs to start looking at this. Um, that's just coward's opinion. Right. But uh, that, that's certainly a way of looking at that. But that goes back to your point. We're, we're looking at how do we come up with those, those complex and science means to deal with So thanks. Question, so GMB, even before our KBS field, that it protects Hawaii today, I believe, and I think that's what MDA advertises. Can you speak to, when you talk about Aegis Ashore, having SM3 to layer, another kind of underlayer to protect Hawaii, what more does that do for you versus what GMB does right now? Is it, is it as a girl for all, all of the other things? Yeah, I, well, I'll, I'll start. I, I, I think right now are limited with a number that we can't change. And because of the, by the time we change it, the RKVs coming forward and the uh, MOKV or so forth are coming forward. So you have a window of a gap opportunity. You have a demonstrated ICBM launched launch last two Tuesdays ago. So those regions right now in Korea, in Japan, in Guam don't have a defense against that specific ICBM speed because those systems aren't required or proven to, to deal with that. So there is urgency to try and find a, a move forward because the SM3 Block 2A, Jim Searing, the former MDA director in testimony, said it had capability to defeat ICBM speeds. That missile is co-developed with Japan. And Japan is right at the front lines wanting a capability as soon as possible. So I think you'll see a lot of drive to get that system tested to see if it can do it and prove it. And then if you have that, they're already in low rate production today, that you are able to produce a underlayer 
with our ships that can carry those systems today, the baseline line ships can carry those systems today, to be able to better defend and give another shot. And, and frankly, if you got 44, the North Tom Combat Command is now in a much difficult, more challenging position because before, the whole United States was not threatened by the technology. It was just the West Coast and maybe Hawaii. So now the choices now, she's got to defend all those cities. So having Hawaii have an underlayer would help if they could if they could do that. And, and Guam's got to I mean, these, the other regions have it. So it, 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 there's some politics here because NORTHCOM and PACOM are, are different on that. NORTHCOM's got that responsibility, but Hawaii's a regional defense part of it. So I, I think you'll see it. I think there's language in, in Congress going forward for ICBM. There's funding going forward for that, but they've got to prove that technology as soon as possible. I think Japan, a big partner, is behind that. And I think you, your point is correct. Where, where, where you can have redundancy, that's always a great thing. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. Um, and then the other piece is that you know, the length of time that it takes to just develop one missile, I mean a factory, um, isn't as robust as we would like it to be. Okay? And so the sooner we can start moving in that direction, and for that capability, for something else that can uh, have capability against ICDM, uh, will be a, a tremendous boost for, for really the joint force.
what, once a country or an adversary or whatever you want to, how you want to categorize it, has the capability to do that, they're always going to attempt to get better. And the more they do it, they learn from their own mistakes. Just like we learn from, from our test mistakes. You always gain something from that. So I would, I would submit and I would, that, that that threat is taken very seriously by uh, folks that are on the, on the peninsula as well as our military. I'll just add that you know we, we don't live in a 20 years ago or 10 years ago where we used missile defense as a strategic deterrent on its own. We now are playing with our offense. It's an offense, defense, and deterrent, and certainly we're not ever going to match exactly or even close to their inventory of capability to strike us. We have that mixed deterrent, and you're seeing that with those exercises. Because of the threat that's continuing to increase, those exercises are very important. That offensive exercise over the last two weeks, we had 150 plus sorties in there, demonstrating that they that that offense is with us. So it's really a concern to the populations that you have to have something in place to defend against an accidental or, or premature launch. That, that the populations are, are comfortable and the economies are comfortable. And you're seeing both Japan and, and Korea still moving very strongly in that aspect because they have defensive capability. And that bad was huge. That was the only thing on the, on the peninsula that could defeat a ballistic missile at their magnitude that they're known. So I, I, I think you're gonna see more and more of a mesh between the offense and defense, which we haven't really been practicing um, as we're going to be doing in the future. Sir. Sir, you, you mentioned that it, uh, the length of time it takes to field a weapon system, and I think the last MDAA report of overview I saw over the missile defense system, it said that uh, the THAAD is really a scarce resource. Are you worried whether you can field new units fast enough to, to take care of worldwide requirements? Because is becoming more needed around the world. I, again, my, my answer is no. And, and, and it, it goes back to, you know, our government will set what our force um, caps will look like. So on the Army active duty side, we're, we're, we're at 480,000, you know, congressionally approved individuals be on uh, the active duty in various branches, et cetera, in New York. So I have, so we have in the Army Air Defense pool, 15 major battalions and five and plus one that battery is being developed at Fort Hood. So you can say six, but you know, it's, it's in the testing and uh, fielding phase right now. Um, but to give me, give us more systems doesn't necessarily mean that, that I can man those systems too. And so it's a, it's a sort of like a physics problem at the same time of, of how do you keep up with not only we have, we have more airplanes, more ships, or whatever, then we have men and women to man them. You have to kind of keep those things in balance. And it has to maintain in balance with whatever our strategy is going to be, our national defense strategy, our national military strategy, ultimately our national security strategy. And how are we going to posture our, our, our forces we brought? And then I was going to say it at the end of uh, the last question, but uh, you know, when you, when you do send a, a, a missile defense capability anywhere in the world since Desert Storm, it has clearly uh, sent a message, you know, whether it be positively or negatively, depending on which side of the country you're on. So, when, you know, it's again the, the fortunate opportunity to send the first dad battery into Guam. And, and we, we, we knew that was coming about a week out, and then when it hit, hit the news, it, it, it was huge. It really was. And then certainly we watched just the challenge of. Think what's so hard about bringing just 95 men and women, you know, a radar, a few pieces of equipment, just push them into South Korea, pull them on an open space here, and, and then they're ready to fight, you know, just like we do at White Sands Missile Range in Fort Lister or in El Paso or New Mexico. Um, it, it, it comes with political ramification. What what is what is seen by us as defensive may be seen as offensive by by another country out there. And so. Um, I will tell you this too, is, you know, war plans certainly uh, out, out exceed the, the, the capacity that we currently have. I mean, you know, so we know we have forces in, in, in the Middle East, we know we have forces in, in the Pacific, 
we know we have very little capability in Europe. Um, but I would guarantee you that, that each of those competing combat commands probably has probably that number or more needed for the, the capability that they need for uh, for their something was to happen, you know, in their theater of operation. So uh, decisions have to be made whether we remove capability, um, recommit them elsewhere. Uh, goes back to my point of you know the, the challenge of who's modernizing now, you know, who's doing testing and research and development. And we do it, we figure it out. We always have. Um, and it comes with a cost. It comes with the cost of personal capital. I mean, soldiers and, and airmen and you name know, whoever it is, deploying constantly, coming back and forth, being away from home, etc. cetera. And, and yeah, you can say, well, that's what we signed up for. We need the capability out there. But um, the, the grind takes its toll. And so you start talking about the second, third order effects of who's going to re-enlist for this constant pace out there. You know, ten, 10 years, seven years in, you're on your seventh or eighth appointment, you know, and you have more hash strikes like this all the way up to here, and, and it becomes very challenging. Okay, and so it, that, that's something that we, we certainly have to look at too as a human element. It's not always just about this, hey, this science of putting, putting uh, forces and, and troops, et cetera, on the, on the ground and capability. It's you got to reset them, all right? And uh, it takes a lot to, to train. An individual with this very highly skilled you know, area. So I know I kind of rambled on about a, a question there. But no, that would have been my follow-up question because the ops <laughs> tempo is incredibly high. It is. Forward deployed a lot of those units. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I would just, there's a great example that just happened in Europe where we took soldiers that were not ADA trained from the, the second CR, was it the second CR and the 173rd and trained them in six weeks, and they got out and did stinger intercepts, and they were in Crete, intercepting right off the range with, with our ADA soldiers. So they were able to force change by having other soldiers with other missions incorporated into that mission. So that, that was considerable. And I think what they're gonna do in integration with the Patriot Bad, which has never been done before, is really gonna set where we're going, and whether it's modular brigades or battalions and how we fight, because we've never had to fight like this ever before, where we've had to have all those capabilities in one area. So this is, this is and I, it's probably premature to go forward until you figure out exactly what this is, and whether that's you know going into IBCS or going into being able to use your best launcher with the best sensor and getting that figured out. This is, I think this is sped up the development and the operations of our IMD tremendously. What's happening? Sir. A question for you, General. Uh, the, the integration of all of the sensors, IBCS, where you're fusing uh, your, your common operating picture and then using the best shooter to go engage, engage the threat, uh, it's a great model. Uh, how do you see lasers and rail guns and other advanced technologies playing in that in the future? Speaking of five to seven years yeah. out. How, how do you see that play? Yeah, bullet versus bullet versus bullet, or other technologies? Right. No, I, I'm I'm only going off of what I've, I've heard my, my senior air defense officer say, Lieutenant General Tim Dickinson, at Space Defense Defense Command. They are investing a lot of of uh, effort into this uh, into this capability. Uh, had 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 some shoot. Uh, shoot off some capability demonstrations out of White Sands Missile Range and where, they're, where they can increase the kilowatt of, of, of using laser, laser technology, putting it on potentially a, a ground-based system out there. Um, but at the same time, you know, how high can they go without risking the airspace and potentially, um, whether it be shooting a friendly or, or th anything out there harming more than good, so to speak. So, it, it is definitely heading in, in that direction. I mean, it really is. And I don't think we're the only service looking at that. In, you know, the, the Navy is as well. Uh, but I, I do see that as certainly a way for the future. As those power levels for the lasers go up, uh, would, would a firing of a laser to, to, to provide defense be less threatening to the enemy than firing a missile? I'm, I'm not sure it'd be less threatening. Yeah. I think it gives us more options and potentially cost-effective options at the same time.
Okay. So that is why it's it's just being uh, it's being looked at. You know, I don't say in a super aggressive manner, but certainly in a program or road track. Thank you.
near peer competitive countries. And given the, the UFDs, that capability to fire um, ballistic missiles uh, against Saudi Arabia. Okay, and so my, my point is that it's not the, the Houthis that are doing the, break, the research and development. It is, a, it is a larger country with more expertise in science and technology that has given them that capability to engage that threat against us. And certainly they, they extended their reach in the attack into, you know, further into to Riyadh. Um, and I think the Saudi Arabian has a defense design that is set up well enough to defend you know, the key and critical assets as they deem necessary. I mean, if it did not engage, they, more, they might have had reason for it not to engage in a certain area of their country based on the defense design that the Saudi Arabian government has established for their country. Uh, do you think that uh, what kind of uh, interceptor Saudi Arabia uh, has used? Uh, Pac-2 or Pac-3? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think they're still at the Pac-2 level, but I don't, I'm not, to be honest with you, I'm not in the foreign military sales understanding of if they have, if they have worked a purchase and if that purchase has been delivered to Saudi Arabia. So um, I'm just thinking, I think it's Pac-2, because that Pac-3 capability um, hasn't extended across to you know, several countries. I, I was uh, had the opportunity to be and in, in host the uh, Gulf GCC Missile Defender of the Year with our partners. And at that point in September, they had said since 2015 that they had intercepted over 160 uh, missiles. I, I, I don't know of any other combat, even Israel, that's intercepted that many during that time period. So they're, they're effective with it. They, they might have missed one or two. I, you know, that, that, that's where they're going. Uh, and it's very solid. We'd like to get them more integrated. And, but I think, again, what we're doing in North Korea, which is what we're doing, what, what the U.S. government's doing in Korea, with that fuse of bad and patriot is what is going to be the formula, too, once it's established to go into the into CENTCOM as well as other areas. Sir? Uh, going back. Since the July 4th test and the most recent uh, test of the 15, has the pace within the Pentagon, within your agency of, well, we need to look at additional layers or speeding up some type of fielding, uh, has there been a, a, I guess, a reaction or an intensification of any efforts to add additional layers? There's been an intensification on urgency of, of uh, how do we best spend the, the money that the president wants to give us? And we, we have to, I go back to my earlier point, we, we have to make the best, we have to offer the best military advice, um, working with our civilian leadership and the Office of Secretary of Defense and others and an OMB and to make sure where we put the right investment. The, the investment is best suited on immediate concerns, then that's where some or a portion of the investment will go. If we have confidence that we can we can hedge with time, then we will still continue to put that investment or a portion of that investment in research and technology. And so I know it sounds kind of just a primitive answer, but it really kind of goes back to well, we have to look at this in time and space and in, in, in current events. Um, at the social and the political climate that's going to be advised from, from outside, and then we provide that to our, our leadership within the building. And so the, the good news in just wearing our missile defense hat is that it, it's good when you have a few extra bucks, bucks to spend, and it's always where you spend. If you had one more dollar, where do you want to commit that one dollar? Is it always going to be in interceptors, or is it going to be in sensors, or is it going to be in missiles? Or is it potentially is it going to assist the space program? You know that provides us early warning missile defense, you know, uh, warning as well. 
So that's why I go back once again. I, I had to get smart on my understanding of the space community and the space environment because of the missile defense warning that that layer provides as well. And it's always not just the layer that you provide or sensors that you have at your disposal. It's the external feed and the joint architecture that uh, uh, you have access to. I just wanted to ask an acquisition question. The, uh, the House's uh, FY18 policy bill included a provision that would shift um, procurement from MBA to services for operational missile defense systems. In the Pentagon, where does that conversation stand? Because MBA has a lot of procurement right now. Are the services yeah. that are ready to take that on? Yeah, it's still, it's still being discussed. Um, I mean, missile defense agency, once again, which, which John was here, but they do tremendous tremendous research and development. Um, and, and in their charter, once they have completed you know, the, the test and evaluation of, of a weapon system, it is supposed, it's supposed to get handed off to a service. Um, but there's always, it, it's not always just that clean. That is a perfect example of that right now. That has been with NDA for, I want to say decades, but it's been a decade plus. And by law or by, by charter, it is supposed to get transferred into the Army. The, the challenge is, with, is well, there's still some, some R&D that's always going to be associated with uh, the FAD program. It'll always want to improve it, want to make it better. Um, and then you, you, you give that entire portfolio to the Army. Does the Army get the entire program? So right now, there's just a, a, there's a moderate impasse of, of how that uh, back to your question of how that is going to proceed. So that's what, it's not as easy as you think it is just because the you know, language is stated in there is to do it for the right reasons. And you know, you could have somebody in MDA to give the argument that, yeah, we need to hand it off. And you have the same person or another person in MDA who says, no, we need to keep it for those reasons, okay? And then the Army would say the same thing, hey, give me the full kit. Or, no, I don't want it yet because there's still some tails to that bill that we want to keep over here in the missile defense agency. We figure it out, and uh, the goodness is, is that the system is out there, and it's being operated and served by our, our men and women in uniform. It's just, you're right, trying to get those, those in the right pipes. So. you want to make a quote? Yeah, so, so thanks for a lot. I, I, I think it, we, we can't, whether it's, 20 people or 50 or 100 people um, talk about this enough. And, and certainly your interest this morning is always humbling. And I appreciate each and every one of you coming here and, and hopefully uh, continue to carry the message and, and read things that are that are happening within uh, the missile defense portfolio. Um, it, it's, the, you know, the missile defense domain is, is, is certainly part of a larger and a combined um, operation. And it's not just you know, we're going to settle and we're going to see, you know, 20 ballistic missiles come and we're going to fly 40 and it's just going to kind of go back for, you know, three to five days or 30 days of fight. I mean, there's going to be certainly activities of other things happening. But what I have learned in my 28 years of service is that uh, we, when we position missile defense forces uh, in the military abroad, it sends a message. It sends a message certainly of, of, of deterrence, um, but it also sends a message of, of host nation and partnership building with the uh, countries that we are serving in, um, integration. And you know, when I, when I used to serve in the CENTCOM AOR, you know, I never got rid of the term steady state operation because nothing is steady state. And the term I like to use is we're, we're, we're doing what's called shaping operations. You know, we're shaping the environment, we're shaping um, the options that our senior leadership has and uh, from, from the president all the way down to our combatant commander, certainly to our war fighting commanders on the ground. And so that's, that's what's very important about the capability that, that we, we're, we're privileged to serve with when um, we're not here in Washington, D.C. So thanks again. I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys around. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for taking your time to visit us. We're, we are uh, excited about the future of this mission, and we're going to be out on 
So we look forward to seeing you in our next congressional roundtable. Thank you. Thank you.